As the Lavalette case unfolded during 1759 and 1760, Benjamin Franklin's beloved Voltaire slammed the Jesuits in two satirical plays mounted on the Parisian stage. Educated in the humanities and theatrical arts by Jesuits at the Collège Louis le Grand, Voltaire served the society and the Catholic Church with distinction by becoming their chief critic and debunker, much in the way Will Rogers served Franklin Roosevelt's administration by lampooning the New Deal politicians, or in the way Keystone Cops tickled an America being transformed into a police state. Audiences at Candide howled at Jesuit buffoons strutting about self-importantly drilling their Paraguayan Indian troops. In the account of the sickness, confession, death, and apparition of the Jesuit Berthier, the editor of Jesuit Literary Review, who dies of sheer boredom, challenges the notion that the society is even worthy of existence. With his predecessor, Blaise Pascal, whose provincial letters had alerted earlier generations to the egomania of high Jesuitry, Voltaire provided a spirit of ridicule which gave Jesuit bashing the feel of good sport. Lorenzo Ricci's handling of the Lavalette case resulted in a resolution passed by Parliament on August 6, 1762, condemning the Jesuits as endangering the Christian faith, disturbing the peace of the church, and in general building up a far less building up far less than they destroy. The resolution continued. The Society of Jesus, by its very nature, is inadmissible in any properly ordered state as contrary to natural law, attacking all temporal and spiritual authority, and tending to introduce into church and state, under the specious veil of a religious institute, not in order truly aspiring towards evangelical perfection, but rather a political organization whose essence consists in a continual activity by all sorts of ways, direct and indirect, secret and public, to gain absolute independence and then the usurpation of all authority. They outrage the laws of nature and as enemies of the laws of France should be irrevocably expelled. Louis the Fifteenth, being an absolute monarch, parliamentary resolutions were worthless without his signature. Louis, be, being obedient to his Jesuits, it was highly unlikely that he would ever sign a resolution condemning the Jesuits. Yet sign it he did, and why he did has remained a point of debate. Some say his mistress, Madame de Pompadour, craved vengeance against court Jesuits for implacably denying her a mass. Others say the king needed Parliament's favor to bail him out of debt. I submit that Louis, Louis signed because Lorenzo Ricci wanted him to. When the resolution became law, Ricci released the French Jesuits from their vows. The society as an institution ceased to exist on French soil. Louis consented to allow the Jesuits to remain in France, but as regular clergy. Others went into exile. Père Lavalette, whose financial reform problems had brought on the debacle, was exiled by Ricci to live the rest of his life as a private citizen in England. When the war that had begun in the Ohio Valley reached Martinique, the English occupied that tiny island and took over the Jesuit plantations, selling them, slaves and all, for more than enough money to have paid off Lavalette's debts. In the midst of their decomposing glory, the Jesuits received from Clement XIII an awesome gift designed to make welcome the most humiliating of circumstances. This was the mass and office of the Sacred Heart, with its icon of realistically bloody heart plucked from Christ's ribcage and ignited by an eternal flame. Based on visions resulting from the spiritual exercises made by St. Margaret Marie Alacoque, 1647 to 90, as promoted by her Jesuit spiritual director, Claude de la Colombier, 
Sacred Heart is a Gnostic Jesuit production centering on the Savior's perfect humanity. By devotion to my heart, Jesus supposedly revealed to Alacoque, tepid souls shall grow fervent and fervent souls shall quickly mount to high perfection. Sacred Heart summons true believers to pay a debt of reparation for the world's sins. The debt is payable only by prayers, penances, masses, and, significantly for this epoch in the society's history, social action. John Carroll, so indispensable for the outworking of the American Revolution, was profoundly, profoundly devoted to the Sacred Heart. Louis XV was the effective head of the Family Compact, an agreement between reigning Bourbon monarchs to a present, to present, to present a united front before the rest of the world on important measures. Once he had dissolved the Jesuits in France, he advised other Bourbons to do likewise, although he could not name anything to be gained politically, economically, or financially by the society's dissolution. The issue still remains puzzling, puzzling and problematic, Professor Martin says, unless considered, I submit, in light of Sun Tzu and Ruse. At any rate, the Bourbon Charles III of Spain followed Louis' advisory. Charles convened a special commission to prepare a master plan for ousting the Jesuits. No one could produce any hard evidence against the society, but there were plenty of rumors. A mob had risen up to protest a law Charles had passed forbidding the wearing of wide sombreros was said to have been fomented by Jesuits. A rumor swept across Spain that the Jesuits were nursing a plot to assassinate Charles. The Jesuits supposedly had proof that the king was technically a bastard and should be deposed. None of these rumors were ever substantiated. Moreover, General Ricci ordered the Jesuits to do nothing to dispel them. The result was that 46 of the 60 Spanish bishops decided that Spain should follow the Marquis de Pombal and oust the society. And so the commission drafted an expulsion order, which Charles signed on February 27, 1767. The order was executed by ambush, reminiscent of Philip IV's move against the Knights Templar in 1312. Charles sent out sealed envelopes marked not to be opened before sunrise of April 2nd on pain of death to all provincial viceroys and military commanders. When sunrise came and the recipients opened their envelopes, they discovered two letters inside. The first ordered them to place troops around the Jesuit residences and colleges during the night of April the 2nd, to arrest all Jesuits and to arrange for them to be placed aboard waiting ships at certain docks. If a single Jesuit con concluded the king, even though sick or dying, is still to be found in the area under your command after this embarkation, prepare yourself to face a summary execution. The second letter was a copy of King Charles's original order of expulsion, which began, Being swayed by just and legitimate reasons, which shall remain sealed within my royal breast for ever, and went on to say that all members of the Society of Jesus are to leave my kingdom, Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and other formerly independent kingdoms that made up Spain, and all their goods are declared forfeit by virtue of the highest power which the Lord God Almighty has confided into my hands. The king made sure to discourage any investigation into the causes. It is not for subjects to question the wisdom or to seek to interpret the decisions of their sovereign. Only days before April 2nd, the Spanish ambassador to the Holy See presented a document from Charles to Pope Clement XIII that explained, Your Holiness knows as well as anyone that a sovereign's first duty is to ensure the peace of his dominions and the tranquility of his subjects. In the fulfillment of this sovereign task, I have found it necessary to expel all the Jesuits residing in my kingdom and to commit them directly to your holiness, your holiness's wise stewardship in the states of the church. 
I beg your holiness to consider that my decision is unalterable and has been made as the result of mature reflection and all due consideration for the consequences. Clement, the likelihood of whose submission to the will of Lorenzo Ricci should not be underestimated, responded in a melodramatic vein, as though playing for an audience. Of all the shocks I have had to endure in the nine unhappy years of my pontificate, this one, of which your majesty has informed me, is the worst. The Pope had little more to say except that the king may have placed himself in danger of e eternal damnation. The order was executed during the night of April 2nd and 3rd. Some 6,000 Jesuits were rounded up throughout Spain. They were crammed into the lower decks of 22 warships. In May 1767, the gruesome fleet appeared off Ch Civita Vecchia, the port of the Papal States, and, amazingly, was fired upon by shore artillery. The ships were denied permission to land their human cargo by order of the Pope himself, pursuant to a conference with Lorenzo Ricci. Historians are at a loss to explain why Clement, so devoted to the Jesuits, would impose such cruelty upon his beloveds in their hour of need. The most plausible answer, I would suggest, is that the under, his understanding was obedient to the inscrutable, inscrutable command of his general, whose exceedingly private objective, after all, was to disqualify the Society of Jesus and the Roman Catholic Church as viable enemies of Protestantism, at least in the North American colonies. No longer enemies, they would develop personal alliances. The suffering priests, the guns of Civita Vecchia, were all explained in Amiot's Sun Tzu. Your army, accustomed to not knowing your plans, will be equally unaware of the peril which threatens it. A good general takes advantage of everything, but he can only do that because he has operated in the greatest secrecy, because he knows how to remain cool-headed, and because he governs with uprightness. At the same time, however, his men are constantly misled by what they see and hear. He manages for his troops never to know what they must do, nor what orders they must receive. If his own people are unaware of his plans, how can the enemy discover them? Over the next few months, thousands more Jesuits were expelled from the remaining Bourbon states of Naples, Parma, Malta, Spanish America. Jesuits in French America, Quebec, and New England were left undisturbed, as were those in Austria. In October 1768, the Austrian Empress Maria Theresa a Habsburg wrote her Jesuit confessor, Father Koffler, my dear father, there is no cause for concern as long as I am alive. You have nothing to fear. But Maria Theresa hoped to marry her two daughters to Bourbon princes, Caroline to the son of the Spanish king, and Marie Antoinette to the son of Louis the Fifteenth. Bourbon ambassadors advised her that unless she expelled the Jesuits, she would have to look elsewhere for sons-in-law. The empress reneged on her promise to her father Koffler, expelled the Jesuits, and the girls got their men. Marie Antoinette's marriage would end with the execution of her husband, Louis XVI, in January 1793. Nine months later, she would die the same way, decapitated by the guillotine. This device bears the name of the French revolutionist who, in 1792, first suggested its use in administering the death penalty, Dr. Joseph Guillotine. Dr. Guillotine was a, was a disestablished Jesuit. In January 1769, the ambassadors from France, Spain, and Portugal visited Clement XIII to demand the complete and utter suppression of the Society of Jesus. Clement called for a special consistory of the College of Cardinals to deliberate the question. But when the Cardinals convened February 3rd, it was not to discuss Bourbon ultimatums, but to choose Clement's successor, for the 76-year-old Pope had died the night before of an apoplectic attack, and the official record, said the official record, a heart attack attributed to the pressures applied by the Bourbon diplomats. 
for nearly three months one question charged the turbulent conclave should the next pope be for or against the jesuits the cardinal's choice of lorenzo ganganelli was a triumph for lorenzo ricci although ganganelli was a franciscan he had colleagued with jesuits as a special consultant to the inquisition his celebrated book diatriba theologica of seventeen forty three had been dedicated to ignatius loyola moreover ganganelli literally owed his papacy to lorenzo ricci as it was ricci who had sponsored his nomination for cardinal in seventeen fifty nine almost immediately after receiving the red hat ganganelli had showed evidence of cooperating with general ricci's strategy of gradually disestablishing the society of jesus oxford book of popes indicates a sudden and unexplainable habit change hitherto regarded as a friend of the jesuits cardinal ganganelli now distanced himself from them and now a decade later calling himself clement the fourteenth ganganelli presented what the catholic encyclopedia calls in appearance a hostile attitude toward the jesuits an apparent hostility a theatrical hostility that masked an involved loyalty toward the society clement the fourteenth would do whatever was necessary to help the society win victory without doing battle even if it meant obliterate obliterate yes obliterating the society the bourbons needed appeasing Hastily, Clement promised Charles III of Spain forthcoming documents necessary to proclaim to all the world the wisdom of Your Majesty's decision to expel the Jesuits as unruly and rebellious subjects. He assured Louis XV of France also of a plan for the complete suppression of the society. On Monday, Thursday, 1770, Clement omitted the annual reading of in coena domini on the lord's supper the omission was an astonishing statement this celebrated bull first proclaimed in fifteen sixty eight by pope pius the fourth arrogantly remained reminded kings that they were but vassals of the papacy suddenly discontinuing this assertion flattered the royal self-importance inviting crowned heads to stay on the anti-jesuit anti-church track so necessary for the fulfillment of Lorenzo Ricci's secret designs in England and America. It surely evidences Clement's involvement in the strategy of feigned weakness in order to conceal what Sun Tzu called an order that nothing can interrupt. The non-reading of In Coena Domini rang the death knell of the strong-armed white papacy as manifest by Ricci's political theorist, justinius febronius in his seventeen sixty three masterpiece on the state of the church and the legitimate power of the roman pontiff about which more presently for more than eighty years the papacy had supported rome-based members of the stuart monarch the stuart monarchs exiled from england for being roman catholics not only did Clement the Fourteenth diminish this tradition to almost nothing, in 1772 he began extending a highly visible and most cordial hospitality to the Protestant King George the Third and his family. This tableau was enormously disturbing to American Protestants, who at that time were having extreme difficulties with George. The prospect of England reuniting with Rome gave them all the more reason to strive for what Lorenzo Ricci wanted, their independence. Finally, on July 21, 1773, Clement XIV delivered on his promise by signing the brief Dominus Ac Redemptor Noster, God and Our Redeemer. The brief dissolved, suppressed, disbanded, and abolish the Society of Jesus for all eternity, so as to establish a real and enduring peace within the Church. All the Jesuits' offices, authorities, functions were declared null and void, and all their houses, colleges, hospices, and other places occupied by them to be hereby disestablished, no matter in what province, state, or kingdom they might be found. 
Clement appointed five cardinals an archbishop, a bishop, two theologians, and other ecclesiastical dignitaries to supervise the disestablishment. None of the confiscated Jesuits' records, correspondence, and accounts showed any incriminating evidence. Although Lorenzo Ricci lived a short walk from the Pope's palace at St. Peter's, notice of the disestablishment was not served upon him until mid-August. Guards took the general into custody at his offices in No. 45 Piazza del Gesù. They moved him to the English college a few, a few blocks away. He remained there five weeks. Things were then happening in England and America that make Ricci's presence in the English college extraordinarily significant. We shall consider those happenings in a forthcoming chapter. Toward the end of September, Lorenzo Ricci was taken from the English college to Castel Sant'Angelo, a medieval fortress whose dungeons suggest a prison. His detention was probably less demeaning than we might imagine, as Sant'Angelo contained quite elegant rooms. Popes often use them as convenient resorts, as a convenient resort from administrative stresses. In fact, a secret underground tunnel connecting Sant'Angelo to the Papal Palace at the Vatican. It would be consistent with Lorenzo Ricci's position and strategy for him to stay in personal secret contact with Clement XIV by means of this tunnel. On September 22, 1774, the first anniversary of Ricci's detention at Sant'Angelo, Clement died. He was 69. He had suffered the last year of his life in severe depression, it was said, with morbid paranoia over assassination. His corpse decomposed rapidly, feeding rumors of death by poison, rumors which his famous last words intended to confirm. Mercy, mercy, compulsus feci. I was compelled to do it. For many years afterwards, historians would wonder just whom Ganganelli was addressing. God? A vengeful Jesuit assassin? Ricci? What was the it he had been compelled to do? Disestablish the Jesuits? Commit suicide? The definitive answer may never be known, because the Pope's personal papers and effects decomposed as rapidly as his flesh. What is quite known, though, is that the death of Clement the Fourteenth, in the words of Oxford Book of Popes, brought the prestige of the papacy to its lowest level in centuries, which is presently what Lorenzo, Lorenzo Ricci needed for his American Revolution to happen. We now proceed to examine the structured darkness of the men who lead the attack against the Society of Jesus. It was the same darkness from whence came not only the Englishmen who turned their kingdom into a hated tyranny, but also the Americans who advocated rebellion against that tyranny. The darkness is called Freemasonry, and it is the subject of our next chapter. <laughs>